Okay, well, welcome everybody to uh, Solar Noon Tuesday. All right, I'm trying to mute everything. Thanks, Don. Okay, so the main stories this week are uh, that uh, the CEA um, released a, a study that showed that commercial solar has essentially doubled in the last two and a half years, and it's expected to double again over the next three years. Uh, this is based on a report of about 47,000 uh, installations, which from a commercial standpoint, it's essentially the same amount as would be required to power about 3.2 million homes. Uh, many of these, and where the largest growth is, is off-site. So basically power purchase agreements from larger arrays that are not located at the facility. The top businesses for uh, that are putting in solar are kind of what you would expect them to be. Meta, Meta being Facebook, um, then Amazon, Apple, uh, Walmart, uh, Microsoft, and then you can see uh, off here to the there over there to the there is a list of the top twenty five um, sites. So a lot of big business, a lot of them being installed. The U.S. Commerce Department has uh, released their preliminary findings. This goes back to the big um, investigation about the four Southeast Asian countries that are supposedly um, circumventing the Chinese uh, tariffs by uh, simply moving Chinese production to these countries. And these countries do represent a significant amount of the solar panels that are even now currently installed in the United States. The four countries, Vietnam, Vietnam actually represents about 41.6% of all of the panels that are installed in the U.S., followed by Malaysia. Malaysia is a little over 20%. Uh, Thailand at about 14.3% and Cambodia at about 6%. And then if you add in South Korea, South Korea represents about 11.4%. Then you're at about 93% of the panels come from those five countries, the ones installed in the U.S. Now, surprise, surprise, they, in their preliminary uh, investigation, they found that indeed these were Chinese panels just trying to circumvent the tariff, it was kind of an open secret. And uh, they did find that many of the top manufacturers are complicit in this. But surprisingly, there were four, four con uh, companies called out in this report that were not violating the tariff. Uh, and that was Nui Solar, Hanwai Q Cells, uh, Jinko Solar, and Boviet Solar, which is a uh, Vietnamese company. So those were found not to be violating. Um, now, because this was such a severe disruption to the marketplace, and you could find that um, if you did buy from these and the findings went against those countries, uh, then the purchaser of them could face substantial um, uh, penalties and tariffs as much as 200% of the purchase price. So essentially when this investigation began, they um, really just stopped uh, importing panels from those um, facilities. And so what the Biden administration did was they um, put a two-year moratorium on these penalties, essentially saying we would not impose these penalties. And if we do find against, they won't be imposed uh, retroactively. So we saw a huge spike in imports from those nations uh, immediately after that announcement. In fact, about 59%. A lot of people are saying this is now redundant because of the investment or the Inflation Retirement uh, Reduction, Investment Retirement, Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, where a lot of the manufacturers are starting to set up U.S. manufacturing facilities to take advantage of that um, uh, benefit or that tax incentive. Uh, and uh, so we're beginning to see that happen. Although the final report is due out um, sometime uh, May 1st, 2023. Okay, as an example of the manufacturing uh, and assembly or just manufacturing uh you know they haven't quite gotten to what that means necessarily um 
That's a good question in that, is it manufacturing or is it assembly? Uh, they're still writing the rules as to what that means. Um, because for example, uh, if a Chinese manufacturer mines the silicon in China, makes the, makes the ingot, makes the cells, but then ships them to the US for assembly, is that a US panel or is that a Chinese panel? And, and we just don't know. We don't know those things yet. The assumption is that in order to qualify, these manufacturers will get some sort of gold seal that you'll begin to see on their products saying, yes, this qualifies for that, for that benefit. Okay, so as an example from the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, Enphase has announced that they're gonna be in uh, uh, starting up six manufacturing facilities in the US to make their microinverters. And another fallout from that act is in order to qualify for these uh, benefits uh, for commercial and, and utility scale systems, the installers and developers have to pay prevailing wage. And so the IRS has just come out with some guidelines as to what that means. Um, don't know how detailed these guidelines are from the articles I've read. They essentially say one aspect is it, it applies to all of the people on the site. Con subcontractors, contractors, everybody has to be being paid prevailing wage. And the developer or the person paying that person has to maintain adequate records to demonstrate they're paying prevailing wage. And they said you can get the prevailing wage from a website called sam.gov. I will tell you, I looked up on that site and I have no idea how anybody's gonna get any information out of that site. I, I figure it's a four year degree in order to figure it out, but uh, maybe somebody more familiar with that site can do something I wasn't able to do. But I was trying to see what prevailing wage is for solar installers. And when I was looking this up in Ohio, uh, the average solar installer, according to uh, salaries.com, the average wage for a solar installer is 30.5 or $30,500 uh, annually. It ranges between 26.5 and 36.5, more or less. Prevailing wage, according to a study by uh, University of California at Berkeley, is uh, about $35 an hour. So if you're figuring 2,000 hours in a year, that's going to be close to 70,000. So pretty much a doubling of the salary if they are in paid uh, prevailing wage. So that, that seems pretty significant. Um, the NREL, the National Renewable Energies Labs, uh, just announced their annual cost of uh, solar report. And they found that uh, from quarter one of last year to quarter one of this year, prices increased between two to 12%, largely due to supply chain issues. Uh, when you look at the document that they gave out, um, you can you can see that um, about half of the cost of the solar install, this shows uh, residential rooftop, is about um, half of it is, is uh, product. The other half is installation, marketing, permitting, shipping, profits, things like that. So, um, and, and interestingly, this report did talk about two different pricing structures. This example, we're seeing what they call the minimum sustainable price. So essentially, if you are in fact doing this work, the minimum you could charge is $2.55 uh, nationally on average and still stay in business. And then the average price is about $2.95 per watt. So, uh, I would guess, they didn't say this in the report, but my expectation is if the minimum, the wider the gap is between those two, essentially the less competition, the more supply chain disruptions, things like that are, are causing problems. So anyway, so that's the uh, news from the solar industry. Does anybody have any uh, feedback on that? Okay. All right. Well, then let, let me jump in. Do you know, is that the cost with the tax credit or without the tax credit? That's without the tax credit. So those okay. costs are just basically retail, um, not taking any, any incentives, any, any tax credits, uh, any local incentives that might be in place. 
uh, accelerated depreciation, anything like that. Yeah, when I've when I've looked at some of the commercial systems out there, when you start adding in all of the various tax incentives, such as uh, you know the federal tax incentives, which have increased now, the investment tax credit. Then you've got accelerated depreciation, um, you know, that, that you can take advantage of. Uh, if you take a REAP grant, for example, from the USDA, um, it could be 25%. So yeah, the price gets, gets whittled way down. And some people on the call before have mentioned, like in Illinois, where you can be prepaid for 10 years of um, RECs, SRECs, you can actually, at a commercial level, make money by installing solar in that first year. So you you actually have a negative cost associated with it once you've taken all of the uh, tax incentives that are available at the moment. So if I, I hire a bunch of people to put an array up, they all have to be paid that wage, 25 and change? Uh, if it's a utility scale or commercial scale system, uh, they have to pay that wage if you want to qualify for the federal tax credits. Because right. I can see a lot of contractors, and you know, one we installed, it's 90% labor. I mean, you don't need to be a rocket science to put this in. So like most companies, I would see you have a couple of experts in there who would be the foreman and managers and then a bunch of laborers. Yeah. And I can't, I can't see them making money if they're going to have to pay their laborers $25 an hour. That's... It's, well, I think what you'll find, though, is in the total cost of these systems, the labor is fairly minor. Um, you know, when you get past the, uh, you know, the product cost is going to be about a half. Uh, then you've also got the developer's cost, the engineering cost, the site preparation cost, the permitting cost, the interconnection cost. So when you get down to it, labor uh, for install is pretty low. And, and really what they're targeting is the uh, utility scale systems. And on a utility scale system, they generally subcontract with different unions to provide the labor. So they're already paying prevailing wage on that where a union will bring in the guys who all they do is carry panels from here to there for, you know, eight hours a day. Well, you know, four hours a day with breaks. <laughs> so... Uh, you know, so I don't think it's going to be that big of a deal. Um, what's what's nice about it is it should then make sure that the solar industry doesn't just become another fast food industry or or um, Amazon warehouse worker where you're getting paid the bare minimum. Uh, you know, it should be a living wage kind of industry. So I, I think that's very positive, even if it jacks up the cost a little bit. What the government is saying, yeah, it's going to jack up the cost, but we're going to offset that with these incentives. So, uh, you were talking about the uh, you were yep, talking about ahead. the SREX over in Illinois. Yeah, and uh, you said ten year. I thought it was fifteen. Oh, you would know. Yeah, you're you're from Illinois doing the install. Yeah, so if it's fifteen, that's even better. So it is even better. Yeah. So. So when do I get paid twenty five dollars an hour? <laughs> yes, unfortunately, you're the boss, so you're lucky to get paid anything at all. So, <laughs> okay. Any other comments on the news there? Okay. Well, then, what I thought I would focus on, and again, if something occurs to you as we're going through this, feel free to jump in. But I thought we go ahead and focus on uh, the idea of brownfield to brightfield, and what what kind of motivated. Oops, I'm standing behind that uh, little logo thing there. Uh, what what kind of motivated this discussion is you'll hear a lot of these terms thrown around and you may or may not know what they're talking about. So I thought we'd define some of the terms because the brownfield to brightfield is a buzzword you're going to hear a lot uh, in the coming months, largely because the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, does have a 10 percent bump if uh, in the tax credit, if you're uh, developing a uh, brownfield or some place that was traditionally fossil fuel based uh, as far as its economic activity. So, and so the term brownfields, I'll define that a little bit later, but basically a bright field is a development where solar has been installed. They've decided that's a cute little name for a bright field. That's where there's a solar array. So let's look at what some of these terms are that are being bandied about. A brownfield is essentially a site 
that has previously been developed uh, is typically abandoned today, but is contaminated. There's some sort of pollution there that exists that's going to require that the EPA be involved in the development of this site. Now, it might be a, a landfill, you know, a capped landfill uh, is a good example. And I've got a slide here later that talks a lot about how that's being developed. But it could even be as, as localized as a local gas station, you know, that's been on the corner and now you've got chemicals in the soil. So that's, that's an issue there. A gray field has been de uh, developed and abandoned, but doesn't have the same extent of pollution issues. Good examples there might be an abandoned shopping center. And a blue field is something that's near water, uh, typically within the floodplain, uh, so that development makes it un unlikely because of flooding issues, but solar is a, perhaps an option. Uh, there are issues there. And then a green field is undeveloped land, um, you know, and this is where most of the activity has been taking place in solar. Uh, and then, of course, a bright field is where the solar has been installed. So if we look at these um, a little one at a time, the gray field, um, this is, um, I think, very, very promising for solar development. Uh, if you think about there are a lot of these sites that are out there, shopping malls, we're seeing a lot of shopping malls closing, perhaps an old abandoned airport. I remember when I lived in Tampa, there was one of those in North Tampa area that just sort of sat there for, you know, a dozen years or more without being developed. Old schools that have been abandoned, uh, retail establishments, all of these are, are really prime for solar development. And especially with the existence, say, of a shopping center or something like that, or a mall, there may already be a substation or some sort of access to the grid located there because they were large consumers of electricity. So that's one option. Uh, the blue field, well, again, in, in a uh, near the water in a floodplain, if you're going to develop a blue field, you're going to have to have the Army Corps of Engineers involved in this development. Uh, you're going to have to deal with flooding issues with stormwater runoff. So that's another issue. Certainly uh, environmental concerns are going to be an issue there. Um, and, and perhaps some objections because of the scenic nature of that property. That could be an issue there. And speaking of objections, uh, greenfield, greenfield development is one of these where when we do see uh, objections to solar installations uh, out there, it's usually, there's some, some legitimate concerns. Um, if you're taking pristine undeveloped land, then you're gonna, you're gonna get some opposition from folks who say, no, I wanna keep this pristine and undeveloped. Now you're dealing with snow or snow removal, with tree removal issues, um, your uh, stormwater runoff. We mentioned last week about a company uh, uh, that was sued and and find, found against them for developing a solar array that allowed Everybody stormwater to Everybody run on. off in um, in the opposite Video. direction. There. Video. Whoops! I'm gonna. I'm not sure. There we go. Everybody, see them there. Everybody. There we go. All right. Um, so, so we're going to want to um, mitigate that somehow. Now, it's interesting because farmland doesn't necessarily mean uh, it's not necessarily greenfield uh, because the farmers have used a lot of pesticides and uh, um, fertilizers. So, ranch land typically would be a greenfield. Farmland, not necessarily. Now, there's a lot of incentives for people to take their farms out of production and lease them out for solar. The average price that's paid for um, a solar field like that is about $1,000 an acre. And if you, uh, per year, and if you compare that with um, tenant farming, the average cost, if you leased your farm out to somebody else to farm it, it's going to be about $200 an acre. So uh, that's an issue that we're going to have to uh, deal with and, uh, and mitigate. So in fact, when, when you're looking at um, the, 
brownfield as an option, uh, then it, it has a lot of things that are attractive and a number of things that are not so attractive in the development of these sites. One of them, when, when I've listened to podcasts and the like from industry experts, they say it costs about 10% more to develop a brownfield than it does to develop the same solar array on a greenfield. Well, with this tax incentive of 10%, then it kind of evens the playing field on that. Uh, another advantage is that uh, those objections that people have against a solar development coming in, such as it ruins the landscape or it's going to cause environmental issues, those go away because you're developing a piece of property that has already ruined the landscape, has already created environmental issues. So you're going to um, be mitigating some of those, not creating new ones. And then, of course, the infrastructure for the electricity may be nearby. Um, there's a lot of money out there for brownfield development. This is another reason we hear a lot more about it and will continue. The IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, gives 10%, as I've mentioned. EPA has a lot of funding for brownfield remuneration and development. Um, they have uh, assessment grants, so you can assess to see what the issues are. They have grants to help with the cleanup of the site. There's job training programs that EPA has funding for and technical assistance and research that you can draw upon. And then the in Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. And now this is another of these recent mega legislation uh, that went through over the last two years. And this particular act has one and a half billion dollars in there just for brownfield cleanup. So you can draw on those funds if you're looking to develop a brownfield um, as well. So a lot of money there. Um, as I mentioned, the objections to solar arrays when uh, there was a survey done of developers of these large systems, and they have indicated that um, when they apply for the development, objections or challenges for permitting is amongst the top three uh, challenges that they have for the development of these sites. In fact, they said 52% uh, of these developers said that people raising objections to the fact of having solar in their, in their backyard, essentially, have been problematic in the top three. The other two, access to the utility grid infrastructure, that's a big issue and it's going to be a big issue regardless of where it is the other one is supply chain issues again that's depending independent of the site where it is uh, developed so that's the news there let me uh pop it into uh gallery view anybody have any any comments uh any questions about that yeah jay i see you um <clears throat> it would strike me that the everything you just discussed <clears throat> would be really well suited to the grass area between east-west uh, interstates if there's a big wide space, but I don't know how that fits in any of your labels. Yeah, I don't know how that would fit either. Um, the other issue there, of course, is locating anything along a highway uh, of any sort. It's probably going to get hit by a vehicle at some point. You know, everybody drives like a maniac, at least in my experience. So, um, I, I don't know. We've we've also talked about other options would be along the right of way of a railroad, um, you know, where they're putting rails to trails or whatever. That part was listed. Railway lines were listed as brownfield development. Uh, there was talk about in the California canal system, putting solar over top of the canals, which would uh, solve some of the issue as far as uh, uh, evaporation. Uh, uh -huh. keeping the panels cool. So I, I just think there's a lot of opportunity here. If we're going to go to a significant portion of our electricity being generated from solar, we're going to have to go to, it's going to take up a lot of space. That's just a reality. Now, some of that space is going to be on the building's roof, uh, the rooftops of buildings, but some of it's going to be in areas, and I, I feel like it's important that we don't take the best land for solar. You know, we need to take all the marginal stuff. Uh, of course, nobody comes to me to for that suggestion. So, uh, you know, so. Jay, was there any mention about high transmission, high voltage transmission areas? 
Yeah, the access to the grid is always a big issue. Um, I know uh, there was a call out in Northern Ohio. I was doing some assessments up there and they were coming through to all of the farmers who had uh, land that was adjacent to or nearby to these high transmission lines, trying to get them to you know lease their property for solar. So they were most concerned about uh, proximity to these substations and proximity to the high power transmission lines as far as for feeding into the grid. So yeah, that's, I think people tend to take the low hanging fruit. So you're gonna go, okay, let's develop these sites that are close to the transmission, <coughs> that are easy to access. Um, and unfortunately that's some of the best land, you know? So uh, same way somebody's developing a Walmart, they're not gonna go and say, you know, I think I'm gonna develop it on this old abandoned strip mine just because that's better for the country. So I don't know. The government seems to have come in and said, listen, we want to incentivize this. We're gonna give you grants, we're gonna give you money, and, and let's try and make this happen uh, to, to steer people in that direction. So anybody have any other questions there about this or any comments? Okay. Oh, Maybe. yeah, one comment. Um, what is often overlooked is wildlife habitat. Um, it's which it's easy to overlook and it shouldn't be yeah yeah i think uh, when you're saying wildlife uh i know there's been a lot of uh development out in the desert there's a lot of protests around you know the not only critters not only um but but the flora as well insects bird migration patterns nesting facilities things like that and and i think the industry as a whole um is aware of it i think this industry wants to be perceived as green so i think we need to do better than all industries that have come before uh, this is going to be a transformative industry so i i'm hoping that they'll look at things like flora and fauna um uh best use of the property when when these developments are going on uh you know hard to hard to know that's going to happen you know there are going to be bad players out there who are going to sort of ruin it for the rest of us you know but uh, hopefully they'll be they'll behave themselves unlikely but hopefully <laughs> so any other comments all right well hearing none if you have any suggestions for the topic uh, send me an email i would appreciate it but in the meantime uh we'll see you next week all right. Bye-bye. Thank you.